again, everyone. I'm Lisa Abo, the veterinarian at the Marine Biological Laboratory, and today I'm going to talk to you about blood. I'm going to compare the differences between vertebrates and invertebrates as it relates to their immune system, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about what makes horseshoe crab blood in particular so special. Blood is the way that organisms use um, to transport nutrients such as glucose and oxygen to the cells in the body. Um, and it also transports waste products such as protein waste, carbon dioxide out of the body. So I'm going to show you just a simplistic version of, of blood flow through a fish. So you can follow the arrows so you can see the oxygen poor blood coming from the body, it goes through the heart, and into the gills. Those are little hair-like projections there. And that's where it picks up the oxygen from the water. And then that then continues on and supplies the body um, with oxygen and other nutrients. And fish have what we call a closed circulatory system. So that means that their blood is contained um, within their heart and vessels. So we're going to compare that to what an invertebrate um, circulatory system looks like. In this case, a horseshoe crab is our example. So they have a heart which really extends the entire length of their body. And the fluid, the oxygen poor fluid, is collected, as you can see on the left there, you can follow the arrows, goes through the gills, similar to what it does in a fish, and then goes up to the heart to get pumped out to the rest of the body. Um, in this case, we refer to the fluid as hemolymph. We don't call it blood uh, because they don't technically have uh, red blood cells like vertebrates do. So we'll talk a little bit more about this um, in just a minute. And in addition to providing um, nutrients and removing waste, um, the blood or the hemolymph is also really important in immune surveillance. And so this is where the immune cells are located, and this is how the body protects itself against foreign invaders. There are two main ways that organisms defend the body against pathogens, uh, microorganisms such as fungi, bacteria, viruses, and parasites. And those are the innate immune system and the adaptive immune system. The innate immune system is evolutionarily older than the adaptive immune system, and every living organism has some form of innate immunity. This is a nonspecific form of immunity, so in other words, the individual immune cells um, don't have specialized functions. They all sort of do the same thing. And the first line of defense is physical, so the barriers of the skin, the shell if it's a crustacean, and a mucus layer. And if a pathogen does get past the physical barriers, then there's a cellular response. This occurs pretty much immediately upon contact of the pathogen. And an important difference between innate and adaptive is that there's no memory formed. So there's no generation of antibodies, for example. And this is what a typical um, cell looks like in an innate immune system. Um, so in this case, this is an amoebocyte, which is the primary immune cell found in horseshoe crabs. And these cells contain granules, and so when the cell recognizes a pathogen, um, in the case of a gram-negative bacteria, they detect the um, lipopolysaccharide on the external surface of the bacteria. Um, another name for that is endotoxin. And then it causes the granulocyte, or the amoebocyte, specific to horseshoe crabs, to um, release these granules. And then all of those granules are able to um, form a clot, form a uh, plug around the bacteria, and this walls it off from the rest of the body. And then some of the other granules are able to directly kill the bacteria. And these are some microscopic images that I took um, from a blood sample that I took from a horseshoe crab. So you can see these are all amoebocytes here. You can kind of appreciate the fine granules um, inside the cells. And what you'll notice when I show you the vertebrate blood sample, um, there are no red blood cells, because like I mentioned before, they don't have any. The oxygen is carried on a protein called hemocyanin. Um, as opposed to the red blood cells that we'll see in the vertebrates. All right, so we'll talk about the adaptive immune system, which is what vertebrates have. Um, it arose with anathostomes, which are jawed fish. Um, it's much more complex, and it's antigen-specific. So what that means is that um, individual white blood cells are able to recognize specific antigens or pathogens that invade the body, and then mount a reaction or an immune response. 
the reaction to the antigen is a little slower than the innate immune system at first, um, but then the body is able to um, create antibodies to that specific pathogen so that the next time that the body sees that pathogen, it's able to remember and to attack with much more um, speed and swiftness. This is the system that we're sort of taking advantage of when we vaccinate against certain diseases, um, whether it's in humans or in animals. So this is a diagram showing the cellular components of the blood of vertebrates. Um, and as you can see, there are many more cells than what we saw with the horseshoe crab with just the single amoebocyte. Um, some of these cells produce antibodies. Some of them um, degranulate, similar to what the amoebocyte does and some of them engulf the pathogen. Um, so vertebrates use both innate and adaptive immunity, whereas invertebrates use only innate immunity. But it's really amazing how effective that innate immunity is in keeping these animals healthy. This is a blood smear from a skate that I made and stained. And so the, the cells that you see that have the purple center with the pink around it, those are red blood cells. And then the one right in the center with the sort of purple cytoplasm around it, that's a white blood cell. And here's another um, nice little small cluster. Um, there's a granulocyte kind of in the lower um, quadrant there, um, a neutrophil specifically. So a quick review of horseshoe crab anatomy. So this is the external surface. That top part there, the part that looks like a horseshoe is called the prosoma. That middle hinge part is called the opisthosoma. And then the tail-like region is called the telson. And as you've already learned from Dave, um, that it's not sharp. They don't use it in, in defense. They really just merely use it to flip themselves over. We'll zoom in here a little bit to the center area called the arthrodial membrane. And this is where we can access the hemolymph from the crab. So this is the ventral aspect of the crab where you can see the legs there. The mouth is right in the center and then um, just below that are the book gills. And here we are zoomed in just a little bit so you can see a little better. Um, this is actually a molt. This is not a dead horseshoe crab. Um, the way you can tell that it's a molt is if you look at the top surface, the rounded edge of the shell, you can see sort of an indentation or a little divot there, and that's where the shell has split, and that's where the crab has crawled out. So if you see one of these on the beach, um, that's the way that you can tell if this is a molt. And here's a short video of a crab eating. It just happens to be on his back, which is a normal position for them, um, but it's kind of nice because you can really see them um, sort of use their legs there. Um, you can see the chelicerae there, those top little claws breaking up the food and just pushing it right into the mouth there. So most people know that horseshoe crab blood is blue. Um, the reason it has that blue kind of hue, sort of more of a baby blue color, is that there's a protein in the blood called hemocyanin. And that's the um, protein, the molecule that carries the oxygen to the tissues in the body. And because it's copper-based, it has this sort of bluish tinge to it. Of course, horseshoe crabs aren't the only animals that have this blue copper-based blood. Um, other arthropods, crustaceans, um, and even cephalopods or mollusks have this blue copper-based blood as well. So as I mentioned before, what happens when um, the blood comes in contact with an antigen, um, these amoebocytes or these um, immune cells degranulate. So they release their granules and they form this clot. And that's what you're seeing. This is blood that was taken and just put into this glass jar and allowed to sit. And you could see it forms this clot that would be engulfing any bacteria that are present. And then the blue liquid is the, um, the sort of the serum part of the blood that contains the hemolymph. And this is a wet mount um, microscopic image of what those cells look like. So these are unstained. And you can see as I'm scanning around here, um, you'll appreciate just right in the center there, it's kind of um, an odd shape because it, the cell is actually um, degranulating. Um, but you can appreciate those tiny little granules in there. There's a close-up image, it's a little bit easier to see. 
And then this is what it looks like. So it's just this really thick, almost mucus-like substance. Um, it happens very quickly. So getting blood from a horseshoe crab and you're trying not to have it degranulate can be very challenging because it happens almost instantly. In 1956, a man named Fred Bang discovered this remarkable ability of horseshoe crab blood to detect the minutest amounts of gram-negative bacteria. And researchers were able to eventually um, learn how to collect it and purify it. And they created uh, something called limulus amoebocyte lysate. And that's just the substance that they're able to um, extract from the blood itself. And then they use that to test um, biologics that will be going into humans. So um, orthopedic devices, um, vaccines, um, IV injectable medications, things like that. And so in the 1970s, this really took off and it replaced using rabbits um, for the same purpose and no doubt has saved you know, hundreds of thousands or even millions of people's lives. The reason the horseshoe crab is such an ideal species for harvesting this LAL is because they're relatively big, um, they're easy to catch, um, and they have this arthrodial membrane that I mentioned before, um, where they're able to put a fairly large needle into that soft membrane there and um, drain about up to 30% of their blood. It's not technically lethal, the animals are often released if they are not used um, as bait for fishermen, for eel and whelk. But no one really knows what happens to these animals after they're released, how well they do. Um, so there is some concern about the sustainability of this practice, and there are a lot of researchers who are actively um, looking for synthetic forms of LAL to hopefully replace the use of the live animals. Right now, there's an estimated 250 to 500,000 horseshoe crabs collected for this purpose every year. And like I said, uh, many are released, um, but we really don't know um, how well they do. And because they are um, pretty late to reach sexual maturity, around nine or 10 years old, um, we could be having a really serious impact on the populations. Well, that was a pretty brief overview of a very interesting topic, so I hope you learned something. And if you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments below. And thank you for watching and I'll see you next time.